I do want to introduce the panel moderator for today's session on working through the planning stage of developing an institutional RDM strategy. Our moderator is Nick Rocklin. Nick is the research data management specialist with UBC Advanced Research Computing, where he assists researchers in accessing and using a wide variety of digital research infrastructure, as well as managing their data. He co-chairs the National Training Expert Group with the Alliance's RDM Network of Experts, and is passionate about developing training initiatives for the research community. Nick, I pass the floor to you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Jen, and for that introduction. And welcome, everybody. Um, and so before I begin passing things off to the panelists, I'll start by briefly introducing this session. So this is part two of a three-part series on panel discussions around institutional strategies. Um, about a month ago, we had the first panel that was really geared towards discussing the initial stages of developing an institutional strategy, including things like forming a working group or committee, reviewing available support material, and assessing institutional capacity. For this specific session, we're going to be focusing on the planning stages of developing that strategy and focusing on things like envisioning a future state for RDM and creating a roadmap or action plan. Now, uh, for the third installation of this in two weeks on November 4th, we are going to finalize a series by talking about creating a draft strategy document, getting it to the end, and articulating the institutional path forward through a roadmap or action plan. Um, I also want to mention and send a huge thanks out to the tri agencies for supporting this event today. We have Suzanne Board on the, um, the panel as well. Wanting to be clear that while there might be some questions that are specifically geared towards the tri-agency, as we go through with these strategies and this policy, the expertise really does rely in the community, and that's where these panelists are going to come into play. And so we're kind of all guiding ourselves throughout this process. Now, um, I think that's it for the introduction. Let's get into the fun stuff. No need to wait. And so I'm going to start by just um, having the panelists introduce themselves. I would not do it justice. And so um, if people could start by just introducing themselves, talking about their position, their institution, maybe some details about the size of their institution, as well as their personal relationship or involvement with the strategy and where they are in the strategy process. Um, in no particular order, just looking at my screen, um, maybe I'll pass it to Jen A. You're, you're not muted, Jen. I'm not muted. No, I thought I should unmute given that we were going to start talking. So um, hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer Abel. I am the research data management specialist at the University of Calgary. Um, I've been in that position since December of last year. Um, and I have been uh, intimately involved with the development of our strategy. Um, we have just embarked on our community consultation on our first, well, first public draft. We've had a couple before that. Um, and yeah, so we are we are reaching the end of our process, but I think we're still a bit of a ways away before we have a real final product. <laughs> that, I think that's great to hear. And I think um, you're going to have a lot of interesting insights to share with this group. Um, and so moving on, uh, Michelle, you introduce yourself. Thanks, Nick. Hi, everybody. I'm Michelle Edwards Thompson, and uh, I'm officially the chair of the Research Common at Red Deer Polytechnic. We have an interesting journey because we were Red Deer College at the start of this process and are now Red Deer Polytechnic. So there's been some stuff going on here. Um, I have been with the college now, the Polytechnic, for about 15, 16 years. So I am a librarian by education and vocation, but now work more with the research office supporting researchers at every stage of their research process. Um, I led the process of developing the strategy, working with the, um, the steering committee. We have a draft that has gone out for feedback. We've got the feedback back and it's now all sitting on my desk in a folder waiting for me to turn it into a second draft. So um, I'm going to say thank you to the organizers for inviting me to do this because it made me open the folder, which was really useful. So thank you for that. 
Thank you for being here. And um, I'm, I'm glad we were able to help you kind of push things forward in um, a, a weird back channel kind of way. Um, and then um, moving on to Kayla. Hello, I am Kaylin Casper. I am the STEM and Data Librarian at Ontario Tech University in Oshawa, Ontario. Um, I've been in my role for uh, just about three years. Um, and in my role, I have both liaison responsibilities for the Faculty of Science, and then I also um, hold the library's data portfolio, so it includes research data management, but also data resources, uh, data consultations, and things like that. Um, our institutions on the on the smaller side, maybe about 10,000 students, with the majority being undergraduates, um, sort of like 80, 87 or so thousand undergraduates and about 800, sorry, yeah, 800 graduate students. Um, I sit on the Research Data Management Steering Committee of representing the library. Um, the uh, committee is co-chaired by the, our university librarian, as well as the um, executive director of the Office of Research Study uh, Services. Uh, so this library representation from multiple uh, aims there. Um, so we're aware in the strategy process. I would say we're, we're generally in the planning stage a little bit um, sort of earlier in that than, than um, my fellow panelists are. Our draft is, is being sort of work, worked on. It hasn't gone out for consultation um, yet. Um, and that that the the timeline for that is, is in process. Okay, fantastic. And then um, Suzanne, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Happy to, to introduce myself. I'm Suzanne Board. I am Deputy Director for Policy and International at SHRC. I'm here representing the agencies uh, in case there are questions that should be best posed to the agencies as opposed to the panelists here and happy to uh, to provide, you know, whatever basic um, info that we've got to share at the at the from the agencies. Um, just want to say I've been working um, in, in on work related to this, the research data management policy for several years and and have uh, been pleased to engage with uh, the um, Canadian institutions that have a really important perspective and a role to play um, advancing RDM uh, culture within Canada. So thanks. Yeah, and thank you so much for being here. And so um, for the audience, we, we do have a couple of um, questions to get the conversation going, but we really do encourage you to ask your own questions either via the Q&A or chat, and we'll try to seamlessly work it into the conversations as, uh, as they unfold. But let's kick things off. Um, and so I think it's, it's pretty well understood that there are similarities between academic institutions in Canada based on things like size, research capacity along those lines. But at the end of the day, every institution really is unique. And it's these unique qualities that can really shape how a future state and roadmap are defined. And so I was hoping we could start off by having you all talk about the unique factors of your institution that have helped inform this future state and, and maybe talk a bit about what this future state look like. And again, in no particular order, never picking on people, um, maybe we can start off with Michelle. Sorry, I had to find the unmute. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I think, I mean, Red Deer Polytechnic, because we have anywhere between five to 6,000 students at any given time, FLE-wise, um, about 300 faculty. So when we were looking at future state, a lot of where we were at also informed the fact that we were starting from nothing. So we literally had nothing, <laughs> um, which made it, the assessment of our current state very easy. Um, but then it was also a question of like, we're never gonna be U UBC. We're never gonna be University of Calgary. We're never gonna be U of A. We don't have that money. We don't have the faculty demand for that. We don't have the student demand for that. So really giving ourselves permission to say, it's okay that we're not gonna be that. Um, our future state can be different and we can rely on consortial things that are happening. We can rely on things that the Alliance is building that we can use to help our researchers. We can rely on things like the DMP assistant that um, has been so generously have to build all of those things. So when we looked at Future State, it was really looking at what's realistic for the size of our institution, for 
the activity, most of our researchers, um, we have a huge applied research division where they're working with industry a lot. So their data needs are very, very different because very often they're not sharing that data in the same way because it's proprietary data and it might be moving towards a patent or it like there are different contexts there that you need to think about. And we also have a huge body of researchers who are humanities researchers and deep qualitative social science researchers. And so again, that looks really different. Have a lot of math researchers, people who have a lot of health science researchers who are dealing with much bigger bodies of data. So that also informed like are we, we're not going to build a data farm because that doesn't make sense for us, <laughs> nor do we have the money. So I think that that really was where we started was knowing who we are and what makes sense for us. Yeah, I think that that's great looking at yourself in the mirror and then not being any uh, not being misleading with where you are and who you need to support. Um, Kaylin, how could you kind of build upon that? Yeah, thank you. Um, that's great because a uh, share um, or our, our con considerations um, are shared with Michelle as well, being a smaller institution um, that uh, that look at at sort of what other people are doing and and that ability to um, focus on on what fits our institution best. Um, so the size was was of our institution. We're sort of on the smaller side, on the newer side. Um, really informed how this was going to work and um that that is something that was what is was a big factor as well that include also scaling some of the resources available um a lot of a lot of the resources were really really are really robust and fantastic and have sort of many many templates um and, and things like that but but focusing on um what is most most suitable for our researchers and 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 trying um not to muddy the water uh quite so much with with things that aren't as relevant um sort of key as well. Um, in terms of a future state, I think something that was really, really key and really of value was, was this idea of awareness um, as to the pre-existing services and, um, and things like that that would be related to research data management that exist on campus already. Again, in a smaller institution, there's a lot of, um, a lot of people who wear multiple hats um, and things that can have multiple purposes. Um, and so looking at a future state with a strong uh, community awareness of research data management policies and and supports that are already in place um, in terms of, of sort of templates and data storage, data curation, deposit, um, uh, just requirements and, and things like that um, is a key component of, of what is informing the future state and um, something that's being, being worked towards. So this idea that um, the, these things exist and, and are here to help um, and can be repurposed in that way. So building on what's available um, will be really key. Okay, that's great. I'm going to let Jen uh, answer this question as well, but there's um, there's some questions that have arisen in the chat that might kind of, I'll circle back to afterwards. But um, Jen, do you wanna start speaking to how, how you Calgary has been approaching this? Yeah, so I would say, I, I mean, U Calgary is a is a large research institution, um, as our, our senior leadership likes to remind us. Um, so, you know, we do have a school of medicine, we do have people working with da big data, we do have, you know, lots of people in the in the pure sciences, but we do also have people doing, you know, applied sciences, lots, lots and lots of humanities and social sciences researchers as well. So we've got everybody across the spectrum. Um, I think one of the interesting things that came up when we were doing our, our current state assessment, um, which we did in the spring of this year, was I, I think the research data management support has not had not scaled up with the scaling up of the research activities at the university. So we are you know, definitely a research intensive university. Our RDM support is not very intensive at this point. So we have some support in libraries and cultural resources. We have some support in IT, but we don't have a lot beyond that. Um, and we certainly don't have enough. And for those of you who are, are joining us from Alberta today, you'll know that there have been a lot of cutbacks at the post-secondary level over the last number of years. Um, so in fact, what we probably did have before is less well supported than it was, particularly in places like IT, there were a lot of cuts there. Um, but also in places like our institutional policies and, and processes framework, there is 
definitely a lack of discussion of research data in that framework. There, you know, talk about things like scholarly information assets, but there really isn't a lot of talk about research data. So we came to the process of thinking about what we need to do in the future from this base of we have some resources, we have some people, we have some knowledge, but we are really going to need to build it up relatively quickly in order to support the requirements that are coming down, not just from the tri-agencies, but from also places like the National Institutes of Health, their uh, data management and sharing requirement comes into effect on January 25th. So a lot of our health researchers are going to have to deal with that. Um, so yeah, we, we are going to need to scale up quickly um, to make sure that we can keep up with the needs of the researchers. Uh, that, that's great. And I think it feeds into to one of the questions that has crept into uh, the Q&A. And it's a person asking, and I, and I think that they're, they're just starting out, but they're asking that beyond the research admin office, the library and ITS, like what other departments should be included as essential partners in RDM? And I think that this can look different for various sizes and, and what institutions, especially as you're talking about potential cutbacks and just, you know, the resourcing might not have been there in the first place. And so, um, Kaylin, uh, could you start by talking about how you, how you have seen that? And maybe we'll go around the horn. Yeah, so those are, those three are, of course, of course, key. Um, other representation that we, um, we either have, have secured or are seeking include um, our equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, office, represent, representation from that, that arm. Um, I mean, this is quite possibly included in your um, discussion of sort of um sorry no it's under answered sort of like the research office but um research ethics of course is is um a component that is playing a big role and and is um come has come up a lot in our consultation but sort of like how does this fit in um so if that is not already included in in your question or what you're one of those groups you're talking about definitely research ethics um consultation there um so it's just general gen, you know legal general counsel um that's sort of standard. I, I know this is going to come up. I, I see this in another question. We'll probably touch on this um, specifically, but um, the exploration of an Indigenous perspective and advisor uh, is also something that um, I don't think has been secured on our committee, but is 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 in discussion and is being sought um, as well. As you were speaking, I'm, I'm sorry that I clicked answer and disappeared from that live. I, I will wait to clear the answers till everyone has spoken. Um, I'll pass it on to Jenna to continue that. And it's in the answered column if you wanted to refresh yourself on what the question was. Yeah, so I, I can I can go off what Kaylin was saying. And yeah, yeah, so we, I think, have everybody involved um, that Kaylin mentioned. We are going to be talking to the... EDI folks, I think next month, um, we hadn't had them in right at the beginning, um, but we are recognizing that they're going to be an important constituent. Um, privacy as well is, um, is a group that we have involved. So we have the, uh, the, the privacy, I'm not quite sure what his title is, coordinator from the School of Medicine, actually. Um, so working with a, a lot of, of personal health information sensitive data there. Um, we legal, um, other folks that we've had in the discussions, at least at the steering committee level. So we have a steering committee and a working committee. Um, we have representatives from our graduate students association and from our postdoctoral association, as well as the faculty of graduate studies. Um, and one of the things that we've heard in some of our early consultations from those groups is, you know, we, we need to be considered because we are doing a lot of the work and we want to make sure that, you know, if we're doing this work with this data as well, we want to be getting credit, you know, we want to be recognized as this is part of the work that we're doing. Um, yeah, Indigenous engagement. Um, who else do we have on the steering? We have a lot of people. Um, <laughs> we have, you know, folks from uh, the institutional analysis area because they're also working on an institutional data strategy. So that's kind of happening in parallel. Um, and we're having interesting discussions about where that line is between institutional data and research data, which is fairly clear in my mind, but making sure that everyone understands that. Um, and I will say, because it's been really important for me in the last while, um, one of the people we've had on our, our working committee and, and advising on our steering committee uh, is a, a person from the, the Vice President Research Communications team. And that has been 
huge in in helping us develop our messaging in helping us think about the the work that we're creating and helping us do outreach and awareness raising um if you can get someone from comms involved early on that is a huge huge help in, in actually getting the message out there in a useful way um <laughs> because there is going to be pushback um that's that's just how it is you know ma no matter what you're going to do there's going to be people who are going to push back against this and having those folks involved early on is going to make it easier to deal with easier to respond to maybe is a better way to say that build the buffer <laughs> yeah yeah okay awesome and uh michelle um i would echo Kaylin's having somebody from the research ethics board we have the chair of our research ethics board um sitting in a room with our cio for over a year and I don't think the head of IT had often actually talked to the person who runs the research ethics board very frequently before. But what it means, because we don't have research computing again, like we're little, that's not a thing that exists in our space. We have an IT department and they do everything on the campus. Um, but it has meant that now when we have questions, we can frame them in a different way for that department because he's been in a room with research ethics and he's listened to those questions and he's listened to those thoughts um and how we're approaching them differently we also had somebody from our um institutional research department because we felt like as we were talking about data transfer they do a lot of those things when they're doing kind of provincial reporting and some of those other pieces that could inform similar process for how we could do that with researchers so even though it's not necessarily research data we felt like from a process and a structure standpoint that they could inform a lot um, we didn't have somebody from our Indigenous service, only because Indigenous services is two people at RDP, and we're trying to be really deeply respectful of their time. So what we said, we did consultations with them as one-offs rather than having them sit through every single steering committee meeting because we just felt like that was far more respectful. And then um, they took that to their steering committees and did further consultation and did further work on our behalf. So that was, again, a way that we just had to think about our resourcing. And because right now Indigenous Services is asked to sit on literally everything. And so we had to kind of just say what's fair. And fortunately, I have a relationship there that meant that he trusted that he knew we were going to bring it. That was also really important from our perspective. Yeah, that that's fantastic. And then there is a question specifically about engaging with Indigenous populations. And I think you you, you hit the nail on the head with all those challenges. Um, Jen or Kaylin, I don't know if you have anything additional to add. Both of you did, Jen, I think you touched on it briefly. I don't know if that's something you can go into in more detail. Yeah, for us, um, the Indigenous engagement has been in a, a, a variety of ways, although we recognize that it's, it's we're still very much at the beginning of those discussions. Um, so we have had a uh, representative, the, the grants rep, officer representative from the Indigenous Research Support Team on our working committee from the beginning, and the Vice Provost and Vice President Research for Indigenous Engagement on our steering committee. Um, our challenge has been that our Indigenous Research Support Team has been uh, very understaffed for the last number of months, so they've just gotten up too close to being fully staffed, so we're hoping that we may be able to get some more discussion with them once the folks get uh, fully onboarded. Um, we also had a chance to present the the context around creating the strategy as well as the draft strategy to our indigenous scholars circle um, last month. So, but we are also recognizing that where we're at right now is at a point where we need to lay the groundwork for future conversations um, and, and kind of everything we're doing on our strategy is laying the groundwork for the future. There is very little that is, you know, here is here is our plan it's all set in stone everything is going to happen in the next five years it's like no this is all laying the groundwork for us to be able to do the work to scale up to where we need to be and part of that is in our strategy saying we are laying the groundwork for future conversations about how to respect support build capacity for indigenous sovereignty governance and man and management um so recognizing and, and underlining and I think like you know 
some of the comments I've gotten back on our strategy so far that we need to make this even clearer that this is the starting point and the discussions are going to continue going forward. Um, so nothing <laughs> nothing that we are, are doing right now is, is I think, can, can be considered the final word on RDM at UCalgary, but it's all going, here is the beginning of the conversation that we can all have on RDM at UCalgary. Yeah, and just looking at the other panelists nodding, I think that that's a really important thing to say, that this is the beginning of a conversation and just it's going to take years, that this is a foundation on which we can continue building on. Um, Kaylin, did do you have anything to comment on with the Indigenous engagement? Um, not not in, in great detail, just that we are um, are working or sort of engaging with that in this way that it's, it appears some other um, people might be as well, just with the idea of recognizing that as a, a critical component of the development of the strategy um, and and that it's also a, a role that that's still being developed and, and consulted and worked on. Well, that's great. And, um, you know, I think people can kind of, that there's a train of thought going on with our audience because um, there's another question that's kind of coming about collaboration, but it's, um, in the guise of who's chairing the committee, but looking at reluctance from participation from other bodies across the institution. I know that can be, um, you know, that there are political borders when you're trying to get these groups who might not have historically worked together. And so, um, Michelle, yeah, if you could start off by saying who is chairing your committees and have there been reluctance from others to join these, these groups? Um, so I chaired the committee. So... <laughs> Um, we, we're really in a very unique time right now because we're transitioning from college to polytechnic because that changes our research mandate because that raises the expectations of researchers for our, our institution. We're building a research data management strategy, but we're also building a research office and we're also redoing all of our research policies and we're also doing so this this was less of a I need to get everybody on board and more of a okay there's one more thing that Michelle's asking me to look at this week that um just because we're we're really just building all of that out so that's actually been a huge advantage because when you're at that stage where you're just doing that with everything in the institution then this is thing and more of just one more piece of us transitioning from Red Deer College to Red Deer Polytechnic and figuring out what that looks like. And so I think for us, for me to get those people in the room, it was a little bit of an easier sell because it was part of a much larger institutional strategy that was happening anyway. Yeah, that's really interesting, kind of piggybacking on just the context of your institution. Um, Kaylin, yeah, who's chairing yours and has there been reluctance on joining? Yes, so our, our our committee is chaired uh, has two co-chairs. Um, so it's chaired by the University of Librarian as well as the executive director of the Office of Research Services. Um, in terms of reluctance, I, I can't speak to any reluctance that I am aware of um, in my role as no, not being the chair. Um, so it's possible that it happened, but none, none that it was uh, uh, um, that I'm aware of. One thing that I will note that um, was identified as, as a bit of a challenge uh, is just movement. Um, so um, sort of identified participants um, that were seen as, as great, great participants, and then, you know, moving on to different projects, moving on to different institutions, going on leave, things like that. Well, something that I'm sure everyone is uh, familiar with in these sort of committees and in the academic environment, um, but that, that came up in this, in this environment or in this context as well, that that um, can be a challenge. I'm sure it's a surprise for anyone working in universities to hear that things can go slowly. It's completely a crazy idea. <laughs> um, Jen, do you want to comment on the, the format of your group and any potential reluctance? So, yeah, we have, um, so for both of our committees, we have a, a co-chair from the Vice President Research Office and one from Libraries and Cultural Resources. So at the steering committee level, it's our um, our university librarian who I think is I think that's technically not in her title, but she's the vice provost of libraries and cultural resources and the uh, associate by Pre vice president research, who's the executive director of the research services office. And then at the working committee level, we have um, one of the associate university librarians in charge of the, the digital sphere and um, my boss, who is the director of grants, awards and ethics in the research services office. 
Um, so we've had that two pronged approach from the beginning. At the working committee level, we kind of have a, a, a third partner in there who is the director of research computing services. So he's not officially a, a, a co-chair, but he's involved in a lot of the, the high level discussions of things like our business case and things like that. Um, yeah, I wouldn't say we had any reluctance. There had been some groundwork laid quite a while before I came on. There had been a, an RDM steering committee started back around 2015 that kind of ceased to exist once not a lot of things happened but so that was kind of spinning that back up again and there had been some discussions between the library and the research area um, over a number of years so there had been involvement of say the library in um, the associate dean's research council um, so there was that connection already yeah again i don't think there was any reluctance i think there was yeah, um, momentum was more of the challenge of, of getting things started, getting all the terms of reference set up, getting people who have the time. Um, and our, our co-chairs of our steering committee are really busy. Um, and our, our, our university librarian has taken on new deputy provost roles over the last few months. So she, her schedule has gotten even busier. Um, so planning what I'm calling the end game of getting the strategy done is is a little more complicated because we're going, okay, we need to find a time for, for everybody to meet and we really want to have both of the co-chairs there. Um, but the fact that the, there are co-chairs means that we can go ahead if there's just one of them at a meeting. Um, so yeah, it's not it's not reluctant so much as it's momentum. Um, there are a lot of people who, who think this is really important, um, but just don't have the time. Um, and the, the other peer, people I wanted to say we have involved in the process is we do have a small faculty advisory group um, who are involved more with the working committee. And they've come in a little bit later in the process, but they've been great in giving feedback on drafts of the strategy. Um, they participated in a panel discussion during our, our in-house webinar series. Um, so that's been a really important group to have involved as well. That's great. And that's great that everyone didn't use the word reluctance and it's momentum, I think, was a great way to put that. Um, sticking on this topic of collaboration, and Jen, your name was called out specifically in this question, so I am going to pick on you. Um, it's someone asking about health science researchers working with ho affiliated hospitals, patient data, and how you might have gone about collaborating or including those groups in, in the strategy development, if that's been something that's been on the radar. So. You Calgary, I mean, we do have a medical school, but the affiliated hospital, which is um, Foothills Medical Center, is not itself a grant holder. Um, all of our, our health researchers who work with health data are working with Alberta Health Services, which is a provincial organization. Um, and we, at this point, we haven't had anyone from AHS involved in the actual process of writing the strategy. Whether or not this is a good thing, I think will remain to be seen. But I think at this stage, the fact that we are positioning our strategy as a document that is laying the groundwork for future conversations means this should work not terribly, because we do recognize that there are there are things that need to be considered in partnerships that involve data that is not generated directly by research in the university researchers in the university. So whether that's health data, whether that's industry partnerships, whether that's working with indigenous communities um, or other community partners, there are a lot of conversations that are gonna to need to be had about setting up a framework to allow for particularly data deposit. And this is where most of the concern that we are hearing from faculty, staff, partners is, how is all this gonna work? Like data management plans, people are like, okay, we can probably do that, although it's gonna be extra work and we don't really want to, but we can do that if we have to. But data deposit is really weirding us out and we're not sure what we can do. Um, so we know that we are gonna have a lot of conversations with Alberta Health Services. Um, we know that we're gonna have a lot of conversations with all of those other partners. How, should we have started them before? Well, I mean, hindsight is 2020. maybe we should have, but again, how much would that have slowed our momentum? And one of the challenges that we've had is, I, as I said, I came in in December 
at which point we had, you know, about 15 months to get our strategy up and running. Um, and it took until April for us to have our first steering committee meeting. So we've really been going, okay, what can we do in the time that we have available? What can we do in our strategy that will allow us to make the most of the time we have now and to set up for productive conversations down the road? Again, recognizing that we don't have all the answers, but we need to target the questions that we need to answer. It's not a great answer, I realize, but it's it's where we are. Well, I think part of this is just being honest with the answers, right? And I don't think that there is a great answer. There's the honest ones, just what's happening. And I think that's the value for a lot of the people attending these. Um, Kaylin and Michelle, I'm not sure if this is something that you could speak to in either of your contexts. I don't know if there are affiliated research hospitals with either of your institutions. We, sorry, is it okay if I jump in, Kaylin? Yeah, I asked both, <laughs> terrible moderator, ask a question to two people, come on. <laughs> but yes, please. Um, we do have some partnerships. We do have some researchers who do work in partnership with AHS. So again, that's going to be something that we're going to have to work out the same way that I think Jen is going to have to, is working it out. Um, we also have that strong industry partnership, though, where we're working a lot with um, for-profit industries who are like idea checking, who were creating um, prototypes for, and then doing data testing on those sorts of things that, again, data deposit is not necessarily appropriate in that case. So we've been hanging a lot on that where appropriate phrase in the policy, I'm going to be honest. <laughs> I highlighted that one I circled it for when I talk with the researchers for when I like this is something because there's also I really think disciplines that have not wrestled with what that looks like yet there are disciplines that that is absolutely their common practice and it's not even a question and there are some of those super super qualitative social studies researchers who are saying no I'm not depositing my interview transcripts and you're crazy to think that I would um and I I also feel like the discipline needs to figure that out a little bit it's not my job to do that so we're just kind of watching some of those things and waiting for the discipline to sort it out a little bit and then saying okay once you've got that then we're going to come in and help you figure out that piece Oh, that's great. And yes, the, the disciplinary challenges and allowing the community of researchers to inform things, I think, is, is huge. Um, Kaylin, sorry for that mixed question that I asked earlier, but please do, do add anything you can. That's fine. I don't have a, a huge amount to add because we don't have um, uh, hospital affiliates. Um, the only thing that, that came to mind that might be relevant to this discussion was that we had... Um, there was a great focus on on having sort of strong definitions and understanding of things like sensitive data and and industry data and what that means and that came up um, with consultation with the the university community and with researchers being like well what is that like what is sensitive data does the data like am I determining that do you have a definition for it um, and so working to have, have strong um, definitions and supporting material around those those aspects um, is something that has been the focus and I think will be of of value. If Go ahead, I Jen. Just, I saw you in, yeah. Yeah, if I can just jump in here. Um, one of the things that, that we've put into our strategy, and I will say that I was inspired to put these in by um, the drafts I saw from, from Queens and McGill. So thank you for leading the way so that people could people could bounce off your stuff. Um, we've put in some guiding principles that really are, are trying to embody our spirit, both to creating the strategy and to the discussions that we're gonna have going forward that kind of get at this area. And we may need to, to tweak them a little bit, but our, our four principles that we're going with are research excellence and impact, support for our researchers and our partners in research, collaboration. And that's not just between researchers, but also between the units that are supporting RDM. Um, and a context-based approach. So recognizing that there are differences between di disciplines, methodologies, um, partnerships, et cetera, that all need to be taken into account when thinking about how, how RDM is going to work. And I can throw those into the chat if, if anyone would like to riff on them. Although if you're on any of the mailing lists, you probably have access to our, <laughs> to our PDF, but I'll put them in the chat anyway. Put them in the chat. And um, yeah, so I, I haven't even got to the question I had about the future state. There's just been so many great questions coming in. 
I will get to it, but there's just two related questions, I think, that that relate very strongly to, to what we've been saying. And it's about researchers' attitudes, engaging them. How do they feel about it when they hear about these strategies? And how is this engagement with potentially different disciplines, maybe that haven't been traditionally or historically um, involved in RDM? And th there's a lot to that question, but I think it's something that's relevant to everybody. And so maybe, Kaylin, you can kick that one off. Yes, so I, I definitely imagine that's relevant to everyone. It's certainly been relevant uh, to me and to to our committee. Um, that there has a sort of I think it's it's talking in the chat as well. This idea that um, that it's like an open data policy, and that now um, all data will be required to be deposited and for everyone to use, um, and basically like that's just what's going to happen. And there's been a lot of pushback against that idea, sort of understandably. Um, but I, I find that what has been most helpful has just been sort of almost knowledge through repetition, so continued um, discussion and continued uh, direction towards those those resource materials, and sometimes you know with um, even with with the yeah you know, so the people who are using it um, they're working with this idea uh, all the time. It seems really simple, like well obviously it's not open data, like this is very straightforward. Uh, but the idea of um, continuing to just reiterate what it is and, and sort of break it down into smaller pieces and be like this is not it's not open data and like let's talk about the type of data that you have um, because oftentimes there's also this idea sort of let Michelle mention that like oh I have proprietary data so either this doesn't apply to me or um, that now I'm going to lose lose all of my partnership opportunities because I have to make this data open. Um, so continuing to have those conversations often on a granular, granular, granular level, uh, if possible, with individual researchers or with individual um, uh, disciplines and um, uh, targeting as well some of the that outreach and um, sort of knowledge building to specific disciplines is something that um, that our group is, is focusing on and, and looking towards um, so that you can address those specific questions and look at the um, um, those those concerns um pulling in the disciplinary experts um as well uh and instead of using them as um almost like like beacons in their in their departments being like so we've talked talked to you now you can go and talk to your colleagues and um and sort of spread that word that it's um clear up those misconceptions um both in sort of the overarching model of sort of like this is coming from the university and from this committee but also this is coming from you know the person in the office next door yeah, I love that idea of knowledge by repetition. I think that that uh, hits home for a lot of us. Um, Michelle, do you want to talk about some researcher engagement and, and attitudes to all of this? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's very similar to what Kaylin and what Jen have experienced. Um, we have some researchers, we have an astrophysicist who like looked at me like, why are you even asking me this question? Because I've been doing this for 15 years. And so like, just get out of my way. And um, we were like, great, fantastic, let's make that note. And then we had historians and literary scholars who were like, my data is the book. I don't know what you want me to tell you because my data is the book. <laughs> and I can't deposit that anywhere because it's publicly available. And um, but what what we where we really started was trying to just because we a lot of our conversations. Um, and trying very hard to say, I want you to be honest with me about what you're doing right now. So this is a non judgmental space and it's okay if you tell me that you're putting it in a USB stick that you're then putting in my pocket and I'm just, we're going to talk about what you maybe should do later, but I want to know now and we found out all sorts of random things like a whole bunch of people have file cabinets that don't lock. So they're saying they're storing all of this paper. And so we were like, okay, so we need to get campus management in to fix the thing. Like that's not even a digital data issue because there's also all this analog data that I think gets lost in this conversation and in the strategy. And we've been trying really hard to think about the analog data, to think about our historians who go to archives and take tons and tons of pictures and copies of things and I had a really good conversation with a historian who went to England to work at Oxford in the um, archive there. And he was like, well, I don't do data. And I said, well, how did you get all your stuff back? And he said, well, it was all pictures on my laptop. And I said, okay, so what if they stole your lap? Or what if they seized your laptop in customs? And he sort of looked at me for a minute and he went, oh, 
So I think it's also starting where people are at and then having that conversation, because this is somebody who would never think of himself as a digital person. He's very, very analog, but he is doing these things. And so, yeah, you still have to back that up somewhere. Yeah, you still have to think about those pieces, right? And it's, again, maybe not about deposit. It's more about just how are you handling your data and what is that looking like? And that's really where we've started and by about what you're doing. I think that also has been a good approach on our campus because then it's less about us coming in saying thou shalt and you're doing it wrong, as opposed to just, I just wanna know what's happening so that then I can get campus management to come fix the lock on your file cabinet if that's what needs to happen, right? Yeah, and that whole concept of data shaming and you come at people with this and they can get protective because they might not have been following that. I think that that's bang on and just figuring out workflows and solutions that are very practical and how that can feed into all of this. That, that's great. Um, Jen, researcher engagement. Researcher engagement. So as I mentioned, we do have our, our researcher advisory group, our faculty advisory group. Um, most of those folks are, are people who are more involved with data, but we do have uh, one researcher who works a lot with archival material um, and with audio archival material, as well as like print archival material. So he was one of the folks who we involved in our uh, researcher panel, which was last week, uh, which wasn't as well attended as I was hoping, but we have, we've been recording all of these and making open educational resources of them. So they're all up on the library and cultural resources digital collections, so it's out there for people to see. Um, so having him be able to speak to things like, you know, if I've forgotten to do something it, while I was in the archives and I need to figure out a citation or something, you know, having having documentation of what I was looking at makes it hugely easier to go back and, and you know, email the archivist and say, hey, I forgot to write down the, the number of this file or this phones or something. Um, it, it, yeah, having all of them speak to the value of documentation was was like, oh, thank you all for doing this. <laughs> it's just like, this is what I wanted to hear. Um, but another thing that we did was we had, uh, we've had a series of what we've called water coolers. The original thought from the, the steering committee co-chairs was we should call them town halls. I'm like, no, no, town halls are where people air grievances. And we don't want them coming in thinking that that's what they should do. We want them to come in and have an informal conversation. So we've had four of those since August. And the last one that we had was specifically designed for qualitative research. Um, and we, I mean, it was open to everyone, but we did also specifically invite some people that our REB chairs had identified as people who are doing interesting kinds of research that don't necessarily follow uh, fall under traditional data. So we have people, you know, lots of people doing interviews with transcripts with populations that they don't want to risk identifying. Uh, we had a researcher who's doing research on smell, which is like <laughs> bizarre and amazing. And, and how is she going to deposit that? But having a, a place where those folks could come and express their concerns, um, because they do have concerns and, and a lot of them were around what is a repository and, and why is why do I have to put my stuff there? Um, and just explaining what the principles behind it were that it's not, you know, it's not a way for the university to take control of your data. It's not a way to surveil the work that you're doing. It's, it's a place that should help to make your data not just more accessible to other people if it's appropriate or at least let people know about it but make it accessible to you in the future so you don't have to handle all of the you know all of the migration um and i think having that session specifically for qualitative research and i think we're going to have to have more of them where it's they're able to air their concerns and they're not you know listening to the astrophysicists and the geneticists and the genomicists and all of those folks going, yeah, but we're already doing this. And why can't you just give us more in-house active storage space? Or, you know, why can't I have five petabytes of data or of storage to store my data on? Um, they can they can deal with these specific concerns. Um, so it, it was a safe space for them. And I think that was really important. And I'd, I'd actually like to thank our, our REB chairs for suggesting that we have that specific water cooler um, for doing that. I think that that's great. And just, yes, the um, the water cooler as opposed to a town hall, I think it's a small distinction, but I think an important one. 
All right, so I'm um, just just looking at time, and there are a couple of questions in the chat, but this is about future states. So uh, I'm gonna, gonna hit one more that I have planned, and I think then one more from the chat. But timelines of future states. I think that this is something that people have concern about. Like, is there a specific timeline you need to do this? Is there an overarching timeline? Are there different periods that you might be checkpointing for specific aspects of the strategy? And just how is that being articulated? Um, Jen, I see you making fun faces. So I'm going to start with you. <laughs> yeah, so it, it's interesting because we kind of changed from where we were in our original future state envisioning to what we have in the strategy now. Um, so originally when we were doing our future state envisioning, which we based on our current state assessment, like we actually reused the MAMIC tool and, and went, okay, where do we want our maturity ratings to be in, in the future? We went on one year and three years in that. So one year past the implementation of the strategy and then three years past that. Um, in the strategy itself, what we are saying is we will do the things that we are going to do in the first term of the strategy. And strategy terms at UCalgary are typically five years. So we've kind of given ourselves a bit more room. Um, but there are some things that we know we're going to need to get done a lot sooner than that. So in the business case that we're making, um, which is separate but parallel and will be going directly to the executive leadership team, um, we are saying what funding we are going to need to support this in the next fiscal year and then in the year after that as well. So we've got sort of the, the broad picture of here's what we can do, you know, here's what our plans are for developing all these supports over five years. And now here's the money we need to do it starting in April. Um, because we're, you know, and we have a couple of plans. We've got one that spreads that funding over um, a couple of years and one that says all the crucial startup is gonna happen in that first fiscal year and we really need it. And that's what we prefer. Now that, that's, that's very interesting to hear. Um, Kaylin, what, what does this look like in your context if it has been something you've been thinking about? So in our, our, our context, a lot of the timelines are, are pretty fluid. A lot of things have sort of like an ongoing um, component um, to them with the exception of sort of reviewing um, current current offerings and sort of how those are going to be snowballed in um, into what is being offered sort of along with strategy. So sort of utilizing again those um, pre-existing um, resources and structures that then sort of the timeline can be very short like oh we've already done this this is great. Um, but generally, almost all the timelines are sort of ongoing and continuing, um, keeping it really flexible and, and fluid at, at the moment. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And yeah, give yourself those layups when you can take them. Um, and Michelle. Um, so timelines is something we didn't do well in our first draft. And we were overly ambitious. We've already blown several of the deadlines that we set for ourselves. So that's absolutely a piece that we are revising. Um, I think one place where we are differing a little bit from sort of Jen and U of C's approach is that we are thinking of this more almost like an operating plan where we would revisit it yearly. And so that's actually what we've got set up is that it's less after five years and more kind of an operational planning tool that we will look at every year and say, yeah, we totally got this done, hmm, that we plan to do, but then this other thing cropped up and that lit on fire. And so this didn't happen and, and allow ourselves the chance to kind of roll some of those things forward. So, but I will say, yeah, we were really over ambitious with our first estimates of that. And we are going to be much more humble in draft two. Being kind to oneself is always um, a great thing. Now, I'm very conscious of time. I can see people slowly dribbling out, but I think that this is a good question to end on. And I think this one's for you, Suzanne. I'm sure you anticipated this in some form, but it's someone asking about an audit for the requirements of RDM and does the tri-agency envision compliance and how this might be, um, be regulated or monitored? Sure. I'm happy to answer this question. Je voulais dire aussi que uh, je peux répondre en français aussi s'il y a des questions en français. Um, also would say that we'd like to, any other questions for the agencies, we're happy to take them by uh, email and maybe my colleague Alex can put our email in the chat. 
So, um, s'il y a des questions en français ou en anglais, uh, vous pouvez toujours nous, uh, nous contacter uh, par courriel. Um, so, on the monitoring and uh, compliance and, and this, this uh, question about audit, so the, the agencies will review, but we will not be evaluating the institutional RDM strategies. What we are doing is once they are submitted, uh, the link is submitted to us, we are then posting that link on a page that uh, where sort of the, for, the, for the benefit of the whole community really to see, um, to see what's happening in other institutions, to, to borrow and adapt, uh, to be inspired by what's happening in other institutions. And um, so it's in that sort of spirit of sort of supporting the collegiality that exists uh, that you can see uh, you know, in, this, in this session today, but also to, to, to support it when we can, the, the collegiality that exists uh, among institutions across Canada. Um, so yes, we're gonna monitor compliance, but the compliance is, have you posted a, um, an institutional RDM strategy? And it's not sort of the, um, you know, not evaluating where an institution is right now. Are they being ambitious enough? There's none of that um, that uh, will be happening from the, from the agency's side. Um, so I think that that answers the question about about compliance and our approach to compliance. Um, and so we won't be auditing, no. Yeah, that, that's great. And um, so we have arrived at the hour. And so thank you everyone for joining. As Suzanne mentioned, if there's any questions for the agency, I think that Alex has been dropping all those links in the chat for emails, please reach out to them. If you wanna discuss this with the Alliance side, myself, Jen Abel, anybody else, please reach out to us too. We've um, had some people reach out since the last one. We're happy to have conversations, broker conversations with people who might not be involved with this. And just, it's, it's a community approach. We're all here to help. And a huge, huge thanks to Jen Abel, to Kaylin, Michelle. This is wonderful. Thank you so much for coming out, Suzanne as well. Everybody for joining us, um, fantastic. Um, Jen P, I don't know if there's any last words here. I'm not. In, I'm not driving this ship. I'm just kind of standing here. So I'm gonna lean to you to. to I think you're the pilot, thing. aren't you? Um, I okay. think Nick. <laughs> absolutely, I think Nick is the pilot, and I think Nick certainly piloted this well. Thank you to absolutely everybody involved in the organizing and this session. Um, our next session, panel three, is titled "Working Through the Draft." stage of developing an institutional RDM strategy scheduled for November 4 at noon Eastern. Um, I did drop the link in the chat, but it probably has disappeared. So I will put it back in. And I also want to say, uh, please stay tuned for some more information. We are in the background working to develop a fourth panel session focused on supporting those in the college sector. Um, we are still in early days and early conversations around that, um, but uh, uh, there is more to come on that. So thank you again to everybody. We will see you November 4. And it, the recordings of the sessions will be available through the Alliance website. <laughs>